Good morning, this is Beyond Wallet and I'm Sumit Chaturvedi. Let's go straight to our top headlines. Natarajan Chandrasekharan to assume charge as new Tata Sons chairman, 53-year-old Chandrasekharan to be first non-family chairman of Tata Sons. Another news from Tata's where TCS goes for share buyback, putting pressure on Infosys to go for a similar buyback as demanded by IT's former founders and directors. Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella, who is on a three-day visit to India, warned that artificial intelligence will have an impact on jobs going forward. And the slowdown that started in October-December quarter of 2016 post demonetization is spilling over into the first quarter of 2017 as well. Well, today is the day when Ayn Chandrasekharan is going to take charge at Tata Sons uh, as the new chairman. Let's hear him. To delight all the people who are proud of the group and we'll work together with all the business leaders in the group to drive a lot of discipline on capital allocation and shareholder returns. And thank you. I look forward to the opportunity to serve the group in this new role for the years to come and seek support from everyone so that we can collectively make it happen. Thank you so much. Sir, 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 just, just thumb the guy, sir. Sir, 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 thumb the guy, sir, sir, thumb the guy, sir. Thank you. So here we saw Ch N. Chandrasekharan taking charge at Tata Sons. He's the new chairman who has taken charge post the big fight that we saw between Cyrus Mistry and Ratan Tata uh, started from October. Well, there was a competition going on between both of them. Who will be able to win this fight? And ultimately, Ratan Tata prevailed. So N. Chandrasekharan, 53-year-old Chandrasekharan, is going to be the new chairman of Tata Sons. He's going to be the chairman the first chairman with a non-family background from Ratan Tata's. Even Saras Mistri was closely linked to Ratan Tata, was uh, one of his cousin's brother. So we'll go to uh, our correspondent Nishita Virendran from Bangalore on this. Uh, Nishita, thanks for talking to us. Will you just briefly tell us how important is that and how uh, how is he going to take charge today? Definitely, uh, this should be the game changer for Tata. Uh, let's not forget that they, many issues have been plaguing them, including the issue of protectionism coming in from the U.S. And then you have the issue of Tata Steel not uh, continuing to make losses in London. Tata Automobile uh, that is also suffering. Tata Teleservices are suffering because of heavy competition uh, coming in from uh, Reliance Geo and also pressure of uh, uh, the merger between Alcom as well as Aircel. Uh, so today, definitely a big day. And Chandrasekharan, uh, who is uh, fondly known as Chandra will be uh, walking into the chairman's office. On the other hand, it's also a big day for Rajesh Gopinath uh, Sumit, who will be taking over as the new CEO and uh, managing director of Tata Consultancy Services, the portfolios that um, Chandra had held for all these years. Speaking a little bit of uh, N. Chandrasekharan himself, uh, he is uh, one of the youngest uh, uh, CEOs that Tata Group had ever appointed in the year 2009. And under him, uh, TCS, which is one of uh, the major profit-making wings of uh, the Tata Group itself, the Tata Conglomerate, uh, its revenue grew up by almost 24%. And you see a lot of expectations coming in for uh, uh, Chandra. But at the same time, several uh, issues, uh, several challenges that really plague him, as I mentioned, the issue of protectionism. Uh, you have the legacy issues. You went on to point out he's a non-family member taking over for the first time. And then you have several litigations that the Tata group is, fa is facing thanks to uh, the spat that took place between Ratan Tata as well as uh, Cyrus Mistry. Uh, so definitely uh, a challenging times ahead. 
for uh, uh, Chandrasekharan, but at the same time, uh, Tata has something to look forward to because he is someone who is a proven horse. He joined the company way back in uh, 1987 as a software programmer. He grew through the ranks and took up the top job in an age as young as 46, something that Tata had never seen. So probably through Chandra, uh, they will be hoping uh, that there will be a change of uh, fortune that he will be able to revive Tata Tele services. But at the same time, uh, he will be able to face the case that uh, Dokomo has uh, filed against Tata Tele in an attempt uh, to ensure that it buys back its 26.5% stake and then the litigations that uh, Tata is facing because of Cyrus mystery. So several factors that need to be considered here. But the biggest issue, of course, uh, since he is coming in uh, as uh, for, from the post of CEO and managing director of uh, TCS, definitely the protectionism from uh, the U.S. is what will be bothering him the most, and that is something that he will have to uh, battle uh, from its very root and probably will have to come together with other IT companies of India. Already, information technology is facing quite a bit of threat from uh, new technology emerging like cloud that we are uh, seeing. Uh, so, yes, uh, this is uh, the right time probably for someone like Chandra to take over uh, Tata. But at the same time, this is not a new company. This is not a simple company. It's an extremely complex company. It is a 103 billion uh, conglomerate. It's over 100 years old. Uh, so uh, it, 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 it takes some other sort of talent to really manage this entire company. And we have to wait and see if Chandra is the man. Well, thanks so much, Nishita, for putting everything into perspective. Now, moving forward... But still staying with Tata Group, India's largest software services firm Tata Consultancy Services has approved a share buyback plan of up to rupees 16,000 crore. Well, Tata Group company said the proposed shares present 2.85% of the total paid-up equity share capital at rupees 2850 per equity share. The buyback is proposed to be made from the shareholders of the company on a proportionate basis under the tender offer route using the stock exchange mechanism. But Tata Consultancy Services share buyback has put pressure on Infosys to go for a similar buyback as demanded by its former founder and directors. The TCS announcement has come at a time when Indian IT companies are under constant pressure to address shareholders' concern, including large amounts of unutilized cash on their books. While TCS had Rs 43,169 crore cash and investments on its book at the end of December 2016, Infosys is sitting on a cash pile of Rs 35,600 crore as on December 31st, 2016. Trigger for the share buyback was Cognizant's $3.4 billion buyback announcement recently with Indian investor groups demanding Indian IT firms should come out with similar share buyback schemes. Now, staying with the IT space where Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella, who is on a three-day visit to India, warned that artificial intelligence or AI will have an impact on shops, even if they are efficient in delivering services. Nadella said that it is an exciting future, but one has to be very mindful of the impact. Nadella's comment come in the wake of Microsoft founder Bill Gates' call for levying taxes on robots that take away jobs from people. Now, India's growth momentum witnessed a recovery in January, but it is not broad-based and overall economic activity remains below pre-demonetization levels, says the Nomidra report. The slowdown that started in the October-December quarter of 2016 post-demonetization is spilling over into the first quarter of 2017. The report further noted that the process of remonetization appears to be progressing well and transaction demand is expected to stabilize by the end of March. Nomura expects GDP growth to slow from 7.3% in third quarter of 2016 to 6.0% in Q4, which is October to December, and to 5.7% in Q1st, January to March quarter of 2017. Moreover, growth is expected to bounce back to an average of 7.5% in the second half of 2017 and 7.7% .7 in 2018, driven by lower lending rates, pay hikes for state government deploys and higher government spending on rural and infrastructure sector. Now going to UK where British Parliament's upper house, the House of Lords, on Monday began debating legislation which would give Prime Minister Theresa May the power to trigger Britain's exit from the European Union. 
Earlier this month, the lower house, the House of Commons, passed the Article 50 legislation without amending it. The legislation is not expected to be blocked by the Lords, but the government could be forced into making concessions as it does not have a majority in the upper house. In an unusual move, May attended the opening of debate in person and started intently as leader of opposition. Labour's foreigners, Smith, gave her speech. Liberal Democrat peer, Lord Newby, scoffed at the government's rosy portrayal of a post-Brexit Britain and the idea that nation had come together after the divisive referendum. If the bill is amended by the Lords, these amendments will be passed back to the House of Commons for approval. The bill will be passed back and forth a process known as ping-pong, until both houses agree on the wording of the bill. There is no time limit to this process, however. ...was the subject of detailed debate in the other place and was passed unamended with an overwhelming majority of 372. It comes to us with a strong mandate from both the people and the elected House and we should not overlook that. Staying with the UK when at a time when uncertainty looms over immigrants in US and in EU after Brexit, their contribution to a country can be understood by the fact that UK's economy would be hit by a whopping 328 million euro in one single day if all migrants stayed at home for a day. The nation's daily GDP too would fall by 4%, according to a new research of New Economics Foundation. While the report also highlights that no less than 26% of health professionals are migrants and if they stopped working for 24 hours, UK's National Health Service would be unable to function. In fact, the number of business will close today to make a point that Britain could not manage for even a single day without the contribution of immigrants. Now to some corporate news from India where Reliance Communications and the Tata Group are believed to have initiated talks to explore a possible union that could see Tata Teleservices join forces with the merged Arcom, ASL and MTS. Sources say such a move could create a strong number three telco behind the proposed Vodafone idea combine and Bharti Airtel amid intense competition triggered by Reliance Geo's entry. Tata Tele's debt will be a big factor in any talks with the Arcom Aircell Combine, which has debt of a similar amount, Tata Sons is looking to clean up the telco's books. There were earlier reports Tata Holding Company plans to infuse rupees 10,000 crore to clean up the telecom unit's balance sheet. And in a fresh blow to former liquor baron Vijay Malia, Enforcement Directorate has written to Home Ministry seeking custody of Malia. The custody has been sought under UK treaty. S Singapore's 2017 budget is set to deliver a modest fiscal push to an economy that's facing a gloomy trade outlook just as it starts to rebound. With China's economy showing consistent signs of recovery, Spurring exports across the region, the immediate pressure is of Finance Minister Keat to provide a large stimulus package when he gives his budget speech in Parliament. Consumer demand remains weak though and with global uncertainty dismounting, the fiscal policy focus is set to stay on targeted measures and plans to spur productivity in a country grappling with an ageing population. Thailand's economy grew at the slowest pace in a year last quarter as private consumption moderated. Cross domestic product expanded 3% from a year earlier. That is the slowest in a year. GDP grew 0.4% from the previous three months, compared with 0.7% median estimate. The Thai economy grew 3.2% in 2016 from 2.9% in 2015. The death last year of the Thai king and a crackdown on illegal Chinese tourists hurt the economy with private consumption weakening there. Now to Paytm, where Paytm, India's foremost online payment fintech company, has announced investing 600 crore rupees in expansion plans. While well, Paytm expansion is to enhance the code-based payment network, 
Sources reveal it plans to add 100 million merchants across 650 districts by the end of the calendar year. Just for the benefit of our viewers, QR, which is short for Quick Response Code, is a label that can be read or scanned by a machine like a camera of a smartphone to access account details of a merchant to make online payments. This payment method through the use of QR was first introduced by Paytm in the year 2015 and now almost 65% of overall transactions are made through QR. Paytm plans to scale up its resource merchants, fintech, literacy and technology to make users more tech savvy and a part of the digital literacy program. Sources close to the development reveal to our channel that it aims to seek deeper market penetration. Now it's time for a short break. After the break, we'll continue with our coverage of markets, both India and global. Stay tuned. Well, thanks for staying with us and it's time for news for the markets. Well, where Sensex and Nifty have opened slightly up today, well, TCS could see profit booking today. Infosys is also quite up. So we are joined by our guest today, Lovely Sharma from Indore. Uh, good morning, Mr. Sharma. First of all, the most interesting pack to be watched out today is going to be the IT sector. How do you see that, that panning out today? Very good morning. I believe, you know, uh, news lately we have been talking about Trump policies and uh, recent news on uh, Trump indicating that the policies related to H-1B visa uh, would be inclusive and will give due consideration to especially Indian IT companies. So I think that is one of uh, a favorable news which can come in for especially IT sector in the uh, due course of time. And that's how the particular sector has been uh, you know, reflecting. If you look at the IT index, it is coming at 10,752. So it's almost like from 9,700 and levels. The IT index has gained almost a thousand points. You are already seeing Infosys above 1,000 levels, so it has also rallied somewhat 5%. I think it's a big boost for overall sector and certainly stocks which are available at very lucrative valuations, which I've already collected uh, from all time highs of uh, you know, 2016 or, or 15, and they are collected more than 20 25%. So, whichever would be lucrative in terms of valuation. Given the fact that TCS is also coming with a share buyback on February 20th, so of course we, there will be some of the favored stocks like TCS, Infosys, or HCL Tech. Mr. Sharma, in global markets, all markets are under pressure. While Nikkei is is almost flat, while other markets, global market Hang Seng, are also flat. Where do you see this heading as far as global markets are concerned? As far as global markets are concerned and giving specific you know, attention on Asian markets, I believe they have seen quite a good rally over a period of time. If you look at STI, it has rallied from 26, 2500 all levels to 3000. Hang Seng coming at 24,180 has also rallied somewhat 6 to 5 percent in uh, you know last month or two. So I believe this correction is just uh, something which is overdue on the charts. Of course, there has to be profit booking. We are just witnessing a morning uh, after U.S. markets holiday, so there was also lack of confidence. And we have certain cues from Western markets uh, related to FOMC minutes and some developments of the Fed policy. But the data overall in Asian economy from Singapore, like exports have jumped, is positive. And some Chinese data also in terms of PMI uh, last month, last week was also positive. So it's just a minute correction we are seeing in overall bullish phase. And Mr. Sharma, uh, if you talk about the coming days, uh, what could be the cues which should be looked out for? going forward, what could be the positives and the kind of rally we saw last week, will that rally be visible going forward anytime soon? See, if we talk about Indian markets, yes, I think it will be visible. Uh, I, you don't know, Biden market is discounting something uh, very big about UP election. As we have already, you know, uh, passed the half uh, phase of the elections, markets are already sideways since the uh, UP elections has, uh, you know, begun. So I believe UP elections is somewhat one of the major cues and market will be uh, waiting or, you know, discounting some of uh, the news, any good news uh, from election giving a clear mandate to some one party like BJP, that might be 
be good, uh, you know, uh, sentiment or good news for the market, and that might be discounted. If it's other way around, we might see some kind of, uh, you know, profit booking. With that, we also have a holiday on Friday, and uh, on Thursday we have uh, effort to expiry. So we also need to see what kind of, uh, you know, rollovers there are in derivatives market. We have already seen thousand points rally. So the rollover statistics uh, towards March contract will also be a crucial number for Indian market. And Mr. Sharma, today we had an interesting research report from Namura that said that slowdown we saw in the last quarter uh, due to demonetization will spill over to this quarter also. If that happens, how do you see the whole market panning out? Because the economic, the macroeconomic fundamentals, if they are not strong, market cannot hold strong uh, the strength for long then. Absolutely. See, uh, we are certainly in a, you know, still over effects of demonetization. Uh, quarter 3, quarter 4 or FY17, I believe are certainly uh, going to see some kind of a stretch on the balance sheet. Specifically, if you talk about FMCG companies or pharma companies, they might take some head or any, any uh, company that has an exposure to particularly this space. So, of course, we are still in a spillover effects. Uh, we need to see uh, what kind of the developments on the policies are there. As far as the financial policies are concerned, financial regulators, they have already eased down some of the policies to take out the amount of the cash. There is no limit. And after March, we are not seeing any kind of a restriction on that. So, yes, there might be some kind of a stretch in the balance sheets of these companies. But, of course, after Q3, FY17, things will be getting much better since we also see some kind of implications of the budget as well. So, yes, in the short term, there might be disruption. We need to be stock specific. And uh, somewhat, we also have to give due consideration to the valuations of the companies that are coming in. But, yes, it will be a kind of a stock specific action. And, Mr. Sharma, now there is pressure on Infosys after TCS to go for share buyback. Well, TCS yesterday announced 16,000 crore of share buyback. That puts pressure on all IT companies. How do you see this coming for Infosys? Do you finally see that Infosys will be able to decide to go for share buyback? Is it really a big reality? It can be reality going forward? I don't think at this point of time, you know, you know Infosys is in a state where they can go for a share buyback. If you look at the TCS, well, they had a very good cash uh, in their uh, balance sheet, so, but Infosys doesn't have that kind of a cash, though they have, but I don't think it is the time where they are looking to uh, actually go for a share buyback. Rather, I would think they would go for R&D and, you know, optimization of efficiency in uh, particularly space like uh, cloud computing or mobile or, you know, these kind of uh, social uh, platform apps. So I believe that at this point of time, I don't think Infosys has that kind of a, a balance sheet. But yes, it has certainly put pressure on other IT companies that they can go for some a kind of a buyback. If not that, then it has to be in terms of dividend that they will be paying uh, after Q4. So I believe this is just some kind of a pressure they will put on the margin. It might be in terms of dividends, but I don't think any other company is likely in a state where they will go for a buyback. And Mr. Sharma, uh, how do you see commodities panning out? How do you see gold, crude, they all panning out? What is the investment strategy an uh, investor can follow there? But generally in the short term and long term, how do you see commodities panning out? See, commodities have been uh, overall in a positive momentum. You look at uh, uh, particularly gold, uh, the strategy would of course be buy on dips. Though we have, uh, you know, FOMC minutes uh, this week later, also we need to see, for, you know, developments on uh, particularly Fed minus and uh, what will be their uh, policy in March. If they, if not in March, then there are 70 percent odds that uh, a rate hike might be coming in June. So prices would be discounting back, but till that, I believe it has to be a buyer's strategy. Specifically, we'll talk about uh, gold uh, coming at 12.40, 12.30 dollars has some kind of overhead resistance at 12.45, but I believe upside is still open towards 12.70. As far as we talk about crude oil, the inventory on the inventory side is not uh, putting much, uh, you know, giving that kind of a support to prices. We are seeing a higher build up in the inventory, so we are not seeing crude oil breaking 54, 55 dollar mark. And somewhat a correction of that point of time we are seeing uh, uh, coming in. So of course, crude oil is somewhat uh, have a resistance. I believe sell-on rise should be the strategy. But in precious metal, it has to be a balance. Well, thank you, Mr. Sharma, for talking to us and sharing your thoughts on this subject. Well, that's all in Beyond Wallet today. But for more news and updates, stay tuned to Beyond. Thank you for watching us.